Well, hello there. Uh, this is Nate Adams with Energy Smart Home Performance, and today we're going to talk about five myths of energy efficiency and uh, generally probably mess with your mind a little bit because uh, learning all these things have certainly messed with ours. So uh, uh, first off, um, uh, why should you care about what I think and what I say? Well, frankly, it doesn't really matter either way, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit. Um, uh, I got into this business uh, working for one of the fiberglass insulation manufacturers uh, and sold insulation to contractors and then became one myself uh, during the housing crash uh, uh, because my job evaporated along with the market. Um, and uh, the more I dug into uh, insulation contracting, the more I found that I didn't know and got frustrated when things weren't working. Um, so about a year ago, I stopped contracting, and Energy Smart changed its focus to uh, consulting and really delivering results for people, so actually solving problems. Uh, as a contractor, though, we got a lot of stuff done, although looking back on it, the results, uh, the energy savings results were uh, not that great from the, the few projects that we got to see. Uh, but there were a couple of projects that, that worked pretty well, but they were when we went further into a house. So it started confirming what we were thinking. So here's a couple action shots of me working, uh, doing some energy auditing, and wedging myself into some crazy places, like on the right there. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, that's a little bit of where I've come from and where Energy Smart is. So uh, uh, let's just get rolling. Um, I found this quote by JFK, and like him or not, this is a great quote. So uh, uh, you guys can all read, but I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Uh, this definitely is true in energy efficiency because I've learned all kinds of things the hard way. Um, and uh, it can really mess with your mind. So this is the first part of the quote you usually see. Here's the second part. Um, now I'm not going to read this one, but basically it says it's really easy to get stuck on what we think um, and to have opinion without really stepping back and uh, thinking your way through it and suffering the, the unpleasant consequences of that while you learn. Um, and that's a lot of what Energy Smart has done uh, through its whole history. So uh, uh, today uh, I'm going to share a lot of things that we've learned. So uh, diving right in, here's the first myth. Insulation is always the best way to save energy. Uh, well, lots of people are going to think this, and may, maybe always is a little bit too strong of a word, but pretty typically this is the first thing that people think of. So let's talk a little bit about that one. Uh, for starters, we need to do a definition. So uh, uh, our value uh, is a, a measure of resistance to heat uh, and how quickly it transfers. Higher is better, and it's good to think of it like sunscreen. So if you're wearing an SPF 8, you're probably not going to get fried. Some sun will get through. You'll probably get a little bit of a tan. But if you go to a 50, almost nothing's going to get through. Uh, it's the same way uh, for our value. It's a really good way to look at it. And Department of Energy recommends R49 up to R60 in attics in colder regions, like uh, Energy Smart is in Cleveland, which is a climate zone 5. There's eight climate zones in the U.S. And by the way, R60 is a lot of insulation. That's a foot and a half to two feet of insulation. So that's not three or six inches. That's a lot of insulation, and that's the recommendation. So from what you see from the DOE, Department of Energy, uh, you would guess that more is better, right? Let's take a look at uh, a couple of things. So for starters, uh, it, for folks that live in cold climates that get snow, they are very familiar with icicles. This is one of the big reasons that we get phone calls to come fix things. Um, and it's really simple. Icicles show heat loss. Uh, if you have icicles on your house, there is heat getting out. Um, uh, and most of the time, that heat is coming from inside the house. So the heat gets uh, into the attic space, it melts the snow on the roof, and then it refreezes in the gutter because it's cold out there. Uh, now, the other piece of the puzzle here is the sun is going to melt some snow, and uh, we can't stop that. <laughs> it, it is what it is. But uh, a great deal of icicles can be reduced if you can reduce the heat loss. So let's take a look at an actual project. This is uh, from a friend of mine. 
This is inside the attic of uh, a very big house. It's a 7,000 square foot house. Um, and uh, it's a brick mansion built in the 20s. Uh, so pretty cool joint. Um, and what you're looking at here, this is spray foam in the underside of the roof. This is only about three inches of spray foam. So this is about an R20, give or take. So a half or third of uh, uh, what the Department of Energy recommends. So by looking at that, you would think that's not going to be enough to stop the ice on this. It's not going to be enough to stop the heat. But let's take a look. This is that house on the outside after a big snowstorm and after a little bit of time so there was some time for the snow to melt. Now if you're like me you're pretty skeptical about this kind of thing and uh, you think oh maybe this is taking just after the snow falls because it never melts immediately. It takes at least a couple of hours before things get going. So uh, let's take a look at the next door neighbor. They have an icicle or two. Um, now, those icicles uh, can leak all kinds of water into the house, screw all kinds of things up. They rip off the gutters. They can screw up the tuck pointing on the brick. There's all kinds of things that can happen from these. So uh, uh, there's three things that kill houses, water, water, and water. Um, now those are the three biggest. And uh, uh, the icicles are definitely one of the things that hurt them. So this house could use some love. Meanwhile, this house already got love, but it doesn't have that much R value. So what's going on here exactly? The best way to think of uh, how to stop heat is to think about a loose-knit sweater versus a windbreaker. So picture it's 30 degrees outside, the wind's blowing really hard. You got a 30 mile an hour wind, it just cuts right through you. Would you rather be wearing, if you only had the choice of one, um, a loose-knit sweater that you could see through or a windbreaker? Now obviously you'd prefer to have both. Um, but you only get one. So if it were me, I'd take the windbreaker every time uh, because it's at least going to reduce how badly the, uh, the wind is cutting through me, where the loose-knit sweater, even if it's thick, the wind's just going to go right through me, um, and it's going to be very unpleasant. So the difference here, the loose-knit sweater is like insulation, particularly like a fiberglass uh, uh, or uh, other type of loose insulation. Um, where the windbreaker is like air sealing. So that's uh, finding a way to stop the, the air from coming into the house in the first place. Uh, and this ultimately is what matters a great deal. So, uh, like I mentioned about air leakage. Air leakage is ultimately the key to pretty much everything. Um, uh, if your house is leaky, that is more than likely the leading cause behind comfort problems. If your energy bills are high, air leakage is typically the biggest issue behind there. And if it is a vapor moisture problem, which typically are the ones that are going to cause uh, uh, mold, mildew, other various nasty things like that, the odds are very good that uh, water vapor is, through, uh, is behind that. And uh, air leakage is oftentimes what's allowing that moisture to move around, because the moisture moves on air to a large extent. Now, if it's bulk water and you've got you know, it's water coming into your basement, that's another story. But uh, air leakage is a huge piece of the puzzle. And surprisingly, it is 30 to 70% of the heating and cooling bill that you pay on your house. Uh, it's going to be on the high side if your house is leaky. It's going to be on the low side if the house isn't leaky. Um, but it is a critical thing. So um, uh, the, the next thing we need to know is, if, if air leakage is such a big deal, how do you measure it? And it's measured with a tool called a blower door. Here's what one looks like. Uh, in fact, this is me in the pink bunny suit. I lost a bet a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, so here I am. But uh, this is the blower door in my own front door uh, in my kitchen. And you can see it's a big fan uh, that's in a red shroud. And what this can do is measure how much your house leaks. And it measures it pretty accurately. Uh, uh, it bounces around a little bit with the wind outside, but uh, um, it, it's going to be likely within a couple percent of where the leakage is on your house. And this is going to tell us if air leakage is a massive problem in your house or just somewhat of a problem. And in most houses, it's a pretty big problem, especially if your house is older. So uh, let's talk about another project here. Now, this is an 1,800 square foot house. Uh, it's actually basically a double wide. 
and it's on a crawl space. Now, the wild thing is this house saw a 40% reduction in energy use, but the insulation wasn't touched. Um, so the obvious question would be what changed? Uh, you know one of them because we've just been talking about it, the air leakage. Uh, this house had a blower door number of 3,000. The units don't really matter, but it got dropped to about 2,000. So about a third of the air leakage was knocked out of the house. And then the furnace was downsized substantially to the smallest one on the market. So it, uh, it can't use that much energy ever because it's small. It's like having a 50 horsepower engine, you know, like a big lawnmower engine. Uh, versus having a Viper, which one, when the throttle is full, is going to use more power or use more uh, uh, fuel. It's obviously going to be the, the bigger engine. So when you can put a smaller uh, engine in a house to power it, things get good along with the air leakage. So what that brings us to is that energy savings is not just about insulation and R value. In fact, it's almost more uh, about, and generally is more about air leakage, um, and then also being very efficient with how you heat and cool the house. So uh, there's one myth debunked. All right, number two, um, a bigger furnace and air conditioner is better. Now we just touched on this a little bit, um, uh, but uh, this is a really typical thing that I hear from people. Uh, it's, boy, the, the contractor came out and uh, he said my house needed a hundred thousand BTU furnace, but he sold me a hundred twenty thousand BTU furnace for the same price. What a nice guy! Um, it, it's actually really bad for you when that happens. Um, but uh, to understand why, you have to take a step back and think about the incentive of the contractor. What he really doesn't want is he doesn't want to call on a day when it's really cold out. I mean, last winter we saw some crazy low temperatures. Um, uh, the design temperature in Cleveland is right about 5 degrees, which means 99% of the time we are above 5 degrees. So three days a year maybe we dip below. Well, last year we saw two uh, spells that were 12 below, so pushing 20 degrees below uh, design temperature. That's a very rare event. This guy doesn't want to get a phone call when the house won't heat. Now the other thing is he doesn't know how much your house leaks because he never runs a blower door test to find out. So he doesn't know what half of the load on your house is. So uh, a great way to think about this is uh, if you were going to a dealer and you want to tell the guy, hey, I'm going to tow a trailer, and if it doesn't tow the trailer, uh, I'm going to come back and you're going to have to buy this thing back from me and I'm going to be really mad at you. Uh, so uh, if you don't know how big the trailer is and how much it's going to weigh, what's the guy going to sell you? Well, he's going to sell you the biggest diesel pickup truck he can find that can tow 20,000 pounds. Um, well, the odds are the trailer only weighs 5,000, so realistically you need a minivan um, to drag the thing. Uh, uh, the same exact thing is going on here. The, uh, the, the furnace guy doesn't know exactly how much power it's going to take to heat the house, so he gives you something way bigger than what you need, and that leads to all sorts of different problems. So it goes back to the incentive. He doesn't want to get that phone call when it's cold out that the house isn't heating. So here's how it ends up working. Uh, I love this cartoon. Um, uh, it's a guy, because uh, the cartoon's a little bit tricky to see, uh, it's a guy standing in a huge rumpled suit. And he says, and they sold me the next larger size for only 10% more. Um, and this is exactly the sort of thing that happens. Uh, when it comes to furnaces and air conditioners in your house, you don't want something too big. You want to fit. If you wear a 42 suit, you want a 42 suit. If you wear size 6 pants, you want size 6 pants. Um, you don't want it to be too big. You just want it to fit. So it's not uh, a good deal uh, to get something that's too big. But almost nobody takes the time to actually size furnaces and air conditioners. Um, uh, and if they do, uh, ask them to see the paperwork. So uh, let's step back from this a little bit. What is the ultimate goal of a furnace or air conditioner? It's to keep the house comfortable and typically to keep it at a pretty steady temperature. So let's just use 70 degrees all, all year long uh, heating and cooling. It's just easy. It isn't necessarily what, what's best, but uh, it it's, makes the math simple to think about in the mind. So what I'd like to do next, let's compare a Viper and a Prius going 70 miles an hour. So uh, uh, there's a big catch here. 
um, we're only going to be holding 70 miles an hour. We're not going faster. We're not going slower, if at all possible. We're going to be going up hills and down hills, just like the temperature outside goes up and down. So this is 70 miles an hour being like 70 degrees. Um, but there's a huge catch on this. Uh, you don't have a, a throttle. You don't have a gas pedal. All you have is an on-off switch. Most furnaces are single stage. They're either on or they're off. Air conditioners are the same way. So uh, uh, step back and let's think about this. So here's a Viper, beautiful car, you know, capable of obscene speeds. These things actually do 50 miles an hour in reverse, or at least the first generation did. Um, these are some crazy, crazy cars. But if you have an on-off switch only, um, uh, picture going down the road. So uh, uh, you, you try to keep the thing going 70. It dips down a little bit. You're going, say, 68, 67 when you catch it. Um, and you floor it because that's your only option. It's on-off. Uh, your head snaps back, you, you're, it bounces against the headrest, um, uh, your whole body is pressed into the, the seat hard because these things are so wildly fast, they've just got tons and tons of horsepower. Um, before you know it, you look down and you're doing almost 80 miles an hour because it only took a fraction of a second to do that. Um, uh, maybe you, you, you catch it at 75 miles an hour, but either way you overshoot and you accelerate extremely quickly. And then the temperature drops, or the, the speed drops when you let off the, the throttle, and it drops down uh, until you're below 70 again, and then you romp the throttle to do it all over again. Is that a comfortable way to drive? Would you want to ride with somebody who's driving a car like that on, off, on, off, flooring it, letting off, flooring it, letting off? Of course not. It's not a comfortable thing. So let's think about a Prius trying to do 70 miles an hour. Uh, so uh, with the Prius, we get down to 68 and you romp on the throttle because that's the only option you have and because it doesn't have a huge amount of horsepower it doesn't accelerate super quickly um, so by the time you catch it you let off the throttle and you're doing say 72 miles an hour so you're going just a little bit faster this is just how a furnace would work in a house um, uh, and a right size furnace it's going to take a little bit of time to get it up to temperature and it's going to catch uh, the, the temperature in time to let off before it way overshoots. And it's also going to move more slowly, which is good. Um, our, our bodies really don't notice temperature changes that are less than about two degrees or so. So if you can keep the temperature of a house within a couple degrees, you probably aren't going to notice it getting hotter and colder. Where if the temperature is jumping up and down really quickly, you're going to notice it and it makes you uncomfortable. Um, and uncomfortable people do crazy things in the house that end up burning a lot more energy. Uh, so that uh, kind of gives you an idea of why uh, bigger and smaller furnaces are, uh, are different. So when you back up and you also think about it, uh, which one between the Viper and the Prius keeps you going 70 miles an hour more efficiently? Well, it'll be the Prius, of course, because it doesn't have as much power, and it's also going to be much more comfortable to do because the, te the temperature or the speed, depending which way you're looking at this, uh, is not going up and down nearly as quickly. So that's one uh, reason why oversized furnaces and air, air conditioners are bad. But here's another thing. Uh, short cycles happen, uh, like when you picture that Viper and you romp on it, you don't need to have the gas pedal on. Uh, for very long before it gets up to speed and then you let off. So that would be called a short cycle. Uh, it, if you pay attention to your furnace, it may not be running for very long of a time. That's a bad thing. It's very hard on equipment. Um, uh, they're oftentimes rated in cycles for how, how long they last, but also when uh, the furnace short cycles, it's going to leave a lot of heat inside the heat exchanger, which can rust them out early, and it can take a lot of time off their lives. Uh, also, uh, big equipment oftentimes uh, has a blower that's far bigger than what the ductwork can actually move in the house. So the fan is basically trying to push on, uh, a, a, like a, it's like breathing from a straw. You just, you can't get enough air in and out, and it wears them out early. So I've seen furnaces with fans that fail within two, three, four years um, uh, when the equipment should last 15 or 20 because the equipment's oversized. Um, and that equipment is short cycling at the same time as well. 
So here's another problem, and this is oftentimes what people are calling me to solve, uh, or calling Energy Smart to solve. Uh, uh, it, it's rooms that don't heat or cool well. Now, it could partly be, and oftentimes it, it's a, a building enclosure problem where the air sealing and insulation is not up to snuff. But also, if you have a big furnace, think about how far that air has to go to the room that's furthest from it. So say you've got a two-story house and you've got a bedroom at the far corner away from the furnace. So the furnace kicks on and it starts to warm up the ductwork. It starts blowing the air through. Uh, it, it heads off to all the easy places that are close to uh, uh, the furnace itself. And then gradually that air makes it down to the end of the, the basement and then heads up to that bedroom that's at the far point. So by the time that ductwork is all up to temperature, so the air going through it is up to temperature, uh, it, the furnace is about to shut off. So that room never gets that much heat. And oftentimes that room also has more outside walls than what uh, uh, other rooms in the house do. So it never got up to temperature anyway. It's, it's losing temperature too fast and it's not getting heated well enough. So these sorts of things are causing problems. And if you have an oversized furnace, it just doesn't run long enough to heat that room. Where if you have a right size furnace, it's going to run long enough and consistently enough to have a much higher likelihood of heating that room well. Although again, the building enclosure has to be in good shape. And then the other side of that coin is, of course, uh, it's not going to cool well out there either. So uh, typically it's the same rooms that don't heat or cool well. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Um, this is a chart from an ECOB thermostat, which is something that we really like to work with because it's the only one that does data logging on the market. So we can actually see what's going on inside your house, uh, which is a very, very good thing for us to have. It's a, we end up being able to read this like Neo in the matrix, just being able to see ones and zeros. So we can see problems in your house just from looking at this. So. Uh, let's talk about what these various lines are. So this green line here, this is temperature inside the house. The red dashed line, this is the set point. Uh, down here, this black line, this is the outside temperature. So you can see it going up and down. Uh, so when this report was run, it was between um, uh, basically 30 and 55 degrees, somewhere in that range, it was running up and down. Um, the little gray line you can barely see here, this is indoor humidity. And then this is a really important one down here, these red spikes. This is when the furnace turned on. So short cycles look just like this, it's a spike. Um, so you can tell from these little spikes that this furnace is oversized because it barely has to run to heat the house. Now the other thing you have to keep in mind is it's not crazy cold outside, so the furnace is going to tend to be oversized. Um, it's like having that Viper, if you want to go 20 miles an hour, you, you don't have to hit the gas very often at all because it's going to take very little power to, to keep it going that speed. Um, same thing happens in a house. But uh, this green line, this is really the critical thing here. So uh, take a look at how quickly it goes up. See, each, each time the furnace kicks on, the temperature jumps really quickly. So this is showing you the furnace is oversized and that the temperature is moving around really quick. Um, now on the flip side, see where the, the lines are coming down really quickly as well? Now this is a weird anomaly. Um, uh, it's uh, another issue going on entirely. But uh, where you see it going down quickly, that means that the house sucks, as we say. Uh, it's a leaky house. Um, it's not well insulated. The temperature is dropping off the cliff very quickly. Uh, when the furnace turns off. So uh, does this look like driving that Viper? Uh, it's up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. This is not a comfortable way to live. Our bodies have a lot of temperature sensors. We've got somewhere in the ballpark of 10,000 temperature sensors in our body where our houses have one, the thermostat. And it's typically in the warmest room in the house. Uh, in fact, that's what was happening here. Uh, the, 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 the room where this thermostat is is uh, a sunny room. So the sun shines and it warms that room up, but the rest of the house, meanwhile, is falling off a cliff temperature-wise and getting much less comfortable. So um, there's a lot of different factors going on uh, in this graph. So uh, this is what a house that's in bad shape looks like. Now, this is much more what it should look like. 
uh, this house has a pretty right sized furnace. It's actually been changed since this, so there's some uh, uh, new graphs out that are pretty wild, and the, the equipment runs pretty much all the time, which is amazing. Uh, but uh, it, take a look at this green line here. Uh, you can see it's just barely moving, and particularly in this period here, I mean, look, it's cold outside. Uh, it's down to 10 degrees right here, and it's still under 20 until right here. So this house is not moving very quickly. This is actually the, the big brick house with the foam uh, that you saw earlier. Look how long the run cycles are here. This is just an amazing thing to see. And then right here, these uh, bright lines, this is when it kicks into high stage. Uh, so uh, uh, when, when that happens, well, actually, you, you can see this once uh, the thermostat got turned up, and that's what kicked it into high stage. But otherwise, it's running in low stage to heat this house. This is a very small furnace. This is only an 80,000 BTU furnace, which typically should serve a house you know, more like 3,000 square feet, something along those lines. Uh, in fact, I, I've seen 80,000 uh, BTU furnaces in houses that are only like 12 or 1,300 square feet. This house is 7,000. Um, so it's amazing that this was capable of heating this house. Um, uh, but uh, when you just look at how slowly it moves up and down, this is a quite comfortable home. Uh, and we know this from the client. So uh, uh, this is more of what a house should look like when it's fixed. And this is what happens when you have right-sized furnaces and air conditioners. So here's the truth. Smaller equipment is better. Long run times are good. And also multiple stages are good. Uh, didn't touch on that much, but uh, <clears throat> you can get a two-stage furnace or what's called a modulating furnace, which has uh, more stages than two. Um, oftentimes they're infinitely modulating. Um, and air conditioners can be bought the same way. <clears throat> this is like giving you a throttle. So instead of only having the on-off, you at least have a 50% uh, uh, throttle and then a 100% throttle. So that's what's going on here. This is 50% throttle. This is 100% throttle. Uh, so uh, that's a more expensive piece of equipment, but it leads to better comfort. And that's ultimately what we're going for. But when you downsize the equipment, uh, you also downsize the cost a bit as well, because uh, 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 the larger equipment costs more. So oftentimes you can come out kind of close to even, um, or maybe just a little premium for doing that sort of thing. Um, and that is all part of our design process. So when we go through one of our uh, comprehensive planning processes, which includes an energy audit, uh, you're going to come out with a plan that's going to tell you just what equipment to use. All right, third myth, start with the low-hanging fruit. This is one that we hear all the time, and frankly, it drives us bonkers. Um, so change your light bulbs, wrap your water tank, um, wrap your water lines, just do the attic, just insulate and air seal the attic. That's it. That's, that's going to get you a long way. Um, uh, uh, and it's, it's really not a good way to look at things when we dig into the numbers. So uh, I like analogies. You've probably figured that out already. Um, think of fixing a house like losing weight. So if you're going to lose weight, uh, uh, I'm recording this January 2nd, so I'm on a diet. Um, uh, you need to do a combination of diet and exercise, and you need to be uh, really deliberate about it. You can't just take a pill. They don't work. We've all tried stuff like that. Um, uh, if, if you don't really commit and dig in, you're not going to see results. So you'll step on the scale after a week of dieting, find out you lost uh, you know, half a pound, maybe a pound, or maybe you gained weight, um, and it's really frustrating. So uh, that is really similar so what it takes to fix a house. Um, uh, diet is like the building enclosure. So that's uh, uh, where the, the outside of the house meets the outdoors. That's insulation and air sealing. The air sealing is really important as we, we just found out. The exercise part of it is really like the HVAC. So uh, uh, when you fix the building enclosure, it's like losing weight. When you uh, right size the equipment, it's like getting in really good shape. And when those two things happen in our bodies, amazing things happen. Uh, when they don't happen, uh, we, we feel you know, fat and overtired and uh, out of energy. So the danger of doing not enough, of just going for low-hanging fruit. I mean, when's the last time you heard about low-hanging fruit in a diet plan? 
Um, I'm sure you can cut out sugar, but if you just cut sugar out, do you think you're going to lose 10 pounds a week? No, um, it's not going to show you a substantial difference. And so if you step on that scale after a week and you see very little difference, what are you going to do? You're going to fall off the wagon. Ah, to heck with it. Let's go get a burger and a milkshake. Um, and the same thing happens with energy efficiency. Uh, if you don't see results, feel results, you're not going to be likely to continue. Um, and that's really a bummer because amazing things can happen to your home. You can make it far more comfortable. It can be healthier and safer. The air can be far better inside. The thing will last longer because a lot of moisture problems are mitigated. And it will be much more efficient. We routinely see uh, energy savings in the 30 to 70% range. So all those things can be yours um, if you go far enough. But otherwise, you fall off the wagon. And if you want an example uh, of this, take a look at our blog from not too long ago, um, on November 26th, uh, called A Tale of Two Houses. This compares two houses with pretty similar jobs, frankly, um, and uh, very similar air leakage results. Um, but one house only saved 9% in energy, and the other house saved 47% in energy. So almost a 5 to 1 difference, or right around a 5 to 1 difference. Um, that is an amazing difference, and that's what happens uh, when you don't go far enough. You get these minimal energy savings, and you may get some comfort benefits. That client got some comfort benefits, but he was really hoping to save energy. Uh, that was taking the low-hanging fruit path, and it did not work. So you have to be really careful about doing that sort of thing. Now, here's what can happen. I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of my other failures, of Energy Smart's other failures from how we used to do things. So I call this unintended consequences or failure to get results. So let's talk about uh, the first one. These are friends of mine, Corey and Jen are their names. They live uh, in uh, Cleveland, and they have a 1920s two-story house. So they don't have a third story or a walk-up attic or anything like that. Um, and they called me because they had big icicles. Um, they were icicles that were scaring them. Um, uh, they were worried about them falling off the house and landing on one of their cars and having an insurance claim or uh, ripping the gutters off. You know, lots of different worries that go behind icicles. Uh, their house was also cold, uh, especially the first story, but also the second story. Um, and then they have a, a little sunroom that was also very cold where they uh, put their dogs at night. So uh, we were called in to fix these things, uh, and we insulated the attic, air sealed the attic, uh, saw very little difference in the air leakage of the house uh, because we weren't going far enough. Uh, air leakage is kind of like uh, if you've ever had a bump underneath a rug and you uh, uh, try to step on it and move, uh, like flatten it out, oftentimes it just moves somewhere else. The same thing happens with air leakage. If you don't reduce things enough, just doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, the air just starts leaking somewhere else. That is more than likely what was going on here. We also uh, did some air sealing work in the crawl space underneath that little sunroom area where they keep their dogs. Neither thing made really any difference at all. Um, and we went back twice more to go adjust minor things. Uh, but now that we understand what we understand, uh, we, we know that we just didn't go far enough in his house. Now, another kicker is he just bought a new furnace, and he got a too big furnace. Um, so it's really a shame uh, that we just didn't end up fixing things here. And we, we know a couple of other things that uh, really could stand to get done. But this picture here, even though it's kind of lousy, uh, this is a picture of the icicles that were still falling off the house after the job. Uh, and my uh, belief here is that there's too much heat coming through the walls, and getting stuck underneath the eaves of the roof and uh, uh, then melting the icicles. It's called heat pluming. Um, so there's just more work that needs to get done to his house to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So Corey fell off the wagon, um, and he's frustrated. He doesn't think that this, uh, this works. Thankfully, we're still friends, but uh, uh, that did not show results. That was a failure. Here's another failure. Um, uh, this is a fellow named Matt, and he's got a 1960s two-story house, um, and it's got an addition in the back. So if you look uh, at the picture on the right, you can see the addition sticking out the back of the house. This is the family room, and it's really cold, and that is what we got called for. Uh, now, we were working with the rebate program at the time, so we did what we could get 
uh, the good rebates for. So uh, this will sound familiar from the last one. We insulated. There's there's two attics. So there's a big attic that's up here, um, and then there's an attic here, uh, and then this is uh, the garage. Although I believe this might have been the uh, uh, bathroom on the first floor as well. Uh, but uh, there were uh, two attics in here, and then there's actually another little front space that's behind this as well. So all those got insulated, and then there's a crawl space under here, and then if you see this little door here, there's a, uh, th there's a little bit more living space in here, and there's a little crawl into there. So we insulated and air sealed that. Um, uh, the, the curse is their family room is still cold. And you can read about this. Uh, I blogged about it back in uh, April of 2014, um, uh, where this just didn't work. Now, one of the big things behind this is more than likely he has an oversized furnace, and particularly now that we insulated and air sealed uh, a good deal in the house, we reduced how big of a furnace he needs. So it's like taking a pickup truck that weighs 5,000 pounds and making it weigh 3,000 pounds. Um, that engine, if you have only an on-off switch, is now going to make that thing accelerate a lot more. Uh, it's going to be much faster. And more than likely, the ductwork that was put in for this addition was just hacked into the system and wasn't planned at all. There's no design behind it. So uh, uh, this ends up being the far point from the furnace, and it just doesn't heat or cool well. Plus, if you think about how exposed it is, this has five sides that are effectively to the outdoors. So underneath, the three sides going around the sides, and then the top. Uh, the only part that is uh, facing the indoors is this wall right here where it goes to the house. So it has a lot of forces working against it, and it really needs some more planning and design if you're actually going to see results on that. Uh, so uh, I got a phone call from Matt. He, he's understanding he's actually in a similar world, um, and uh, uh, unfortunately his wife wasn't willing to spend a penny more to solve things, so this is just going to go unresolved, and that's really kind of a shame. But that's the sort of thing that happens. Um, uh, they fell off the wagon. They got frustrated. And that's really a shame because there's they're very good results to be had here. So I could go on and on. You can probably tell. I've uh, touched on three different failures. Um, uh, radical transparency is our policy. We really just try to show here's what worked, here's what didn't work. Uh, there's some that didn't work. So does this begin to give you an inkling that low-hanging fruit just doesn't solve problems. It, it just doesn't work the way that we think it should. So this is something you will see on all kinds of uh, energy tip things. Uh, another uh, blog entry we wrote recently that actually got picked up by several different uh, media outlets was called uh, uh, Why Energy Saving Tips Suck. Uh, and they do. It's worth looking that one up too. Um, uh, it just doesn't get you to where you're going to begin to either feel the results or see any results in your energy bills. All right, uh, myth four, a house has to breathe. This is one you hear all the time. Uh, I've been hearing this for years. Uh, I believed it for years. Um, uh, but uh, here's the truth of the matter. A house doesn't have to breathe. People have to breathe. And then your uh, furnace uh, the, the water heater, anything else that burns fuel has to breathe. Um, but when you think about a house uh, being able to breathe, where does that air come from? Uh, this is a really critical question. The air is going to come from places that really aren't that nice. It's going to come from your attic. It's going to come from the basement. Um, there's nothing bad down there, is there? It's not musty or nasty or full of critters or anything like that. Or or shit crawl spaces, especially if you have a dirt crawl space, those are just nightmares um, from a health and safety perspective. Um, or the other place it could come from is inside the walls. So what could possibly go wrong when you've got all that nice, fresh outside air that you're thinking of uh, coming from there? Well, here's one actual example. This is uh, from some friends down in Nashville. Um, this right here, that is a dead possum that uh, doesn't have much left of it. So it's down to the old uh, fur and bones routine, if you've seen that on the side of the road. This right here is one of the, the cold air uh, uh, returns for the house that uh, broke and fell off right there. Isn't that the kind of air that you would like to have? Uh, this is an extreme example, but the odds are good that uh, uh, it, it, 
if you are thinking you're getting fresh air in your house, you probably aren't. Um, uh, it, when your house leaks, the air is coming through places that you really don't want it to come from. Um, so sealing the house up is a good idea, and then you uh, can put in other systems that uh, bring air in where you know where it's coming from, where you know you can filter it, where you know it's fresh. And what that uh, is called in the industry, this is our little phrase, we say build tight and ventilate right. So you want to make the house airtight and then make sure that you are very deliberate about where you bring in fresh air ventilation. Um, and when you do some design and some thinking on that, uh, some really amazing things can happen. All right, last myth we're going to talk about today. Uh, this is another one you're going to hear all the time. Programmable thermostats always save money. Um, uh, you know, buy a Nest. Uh, I mentioned an Echobee. They're going to save you tons of energy. Um, uh, the, the curse in my world is nobody or almost nobody actually goes back and measures results, actually sees what really happens in a house. Um, and when you do, you start seeing different things. So this is what we learned. Uh, if you're going to get energy savings, uh, they come from when the temperature drops. So uh, uh, picture that a uh, house earlier, and I'll be showing the graph here in a second, where it, it drops quickly and then comes back up, drops quickly and comes back up, drops quickly and comes back up. Um, every time uh, uh, it, it drops, there, there is a chance to save energy there. And when a house is leaky, the, the, uh, the temperature in it falls quickly. Um, now, if you have a fairly efficient home, a newer home, the temperature inside of them doesn't drop that quickly, so there's not a lot of chance to save energy before you kick the furnace back on, typically in the high stage, and uh, bring the temperature back up. Uh, also, if you have a brick home, like that uh, 7,000 square foot house, they have a lot of thermal mass. They move slowly. It's like a, a 400 pound football player or something like that. Uh, you got to hit him pretty hard to get him to move. Um, once he gets moving, he keeps moving. Um, the brick homes will work that way. Now, if your house is leaky or poorly insulated, yes, the temperature is going to drop uh, typically quite quickly and you, you may have opportunity for savings. So um, this is going to look familiar. It's the same graph from earlier. This is that 7,000 square foot brick house built in the 20s. That's not that airtight. It's not bad, but it's not that great. Um, and you can see it's just moving really slowly. So if, if you shut the, the furnace off, what are you really going to save here? Because it's just not going to come down. So this house is not likely to see much. Uh, now on the flip side, there's the other house where it's going up, down, up, down, up, down. So if you set the temperature down, it's going to fall really quickly. And where the savings are is when the temperature stays low. Like say you were going to set it where this line is, so uh, you set it back to 60 degrees. You may see savings from this. Now, if you have a steam boiler, not going to be the case. Um, uh, that can actually end up costing you more. Uh, there's there's a lot of intricacies here. So uh, just making a blanket statement that uh, thermostats save money uh, is a very, very dangerous thing to do, and it ends up leading people down bad paths. Um, and once again, you end up thinking that everybody in the efficiency industry is a charlatan. Um, not all of us are. Some of us are, uh, just as in any, any industry. But uh, Energy Smart works very hard to actually see what's going on in a house and try and understand what's going on so that we can make better predictions of what will actually make a difference. And that is one of the big things that sets us apart. All right, so let's take a look at a real-world world example of thermostat setback. Um, uh, it's actually just running a house at a different temperature entirely. Uh, now, this is one of the few projects that we did when we were contracting that was truly comprehensive. So we did the whole house. We did the attic. We did the walls. We air-sealed the basements. We air-sealed the whole house. Um, uh, and we actually have energy bills on them. Uh, uh, the customer's name is Paul. And he saw about 50% energy savings from doing this. Um, the house is built in the 1920s, and it's a two and a half story house, so it has a semi finished attic, uh, which just is the wall of it right here. So this is a knee wall uh, that's insulated, and then uh, this is the flat in the knee wall attic. So these are little triangular attics if you have a Cape Cod uh, or a house that has, uh, uh, we call them a half story, um, but a house that has, like, say, there's sloped ceilings right above here. Uh, uh, 
that's what this is. And these are difficult houses to do well. They're just tricky. Uh, so this is a really good example uh, because th this house is not perfect now. It's just pretty good. Um, so uh, here's some other things that make this a great test case. Uh, the second year after the retrofit, uh, Paul went back to keeping the house at 62 degrees. Now, this is a, a steam house, so it's a, a little bit different from some other things. Uh, but uh, the year before, he had kept it at 70. Very unfortunate circumstances. His uh, sister was uh, terminally ill and um, uh, she passed away, but he, she, he wanted to keep the house comfortable for her while she was there. Um, but we know that all winter long, it was kept at 70 degrees as opposed to the usual 62. This is a big difference. Typically, this is going to sh show a major difference in energy use. Um, so uh, that's a great thing there. Uh, we got a big leakage reduction out of this house. We dropped 55% out of the air leakage in this house from doing all of the work that we did. Uh, could we have done better? Sure. Um, uh, but it wasn't that expensive of a job. Uh, so uh, that is a, a remarkable result. So remarkable, actually, the uh, energy auditor from the, the, the gas company uh, rebate program didn't believe that we could knock the air leakage number down that much. And he went out and got another gauge and moved the blower door to another door because he thought it was wrong. So that is a big reduction, but uh, bigger reductions are possible if you're paying attention and uh, designing things. And as we know from earlier, air leakage is really critical. So all these things make this house really a good test case. Now I'm gonna flash some data at you. Don't try and take all this in. I just wanna show you that there's actual data that uh, we're working off here. So what we just showed you briefly, uh, we did a little bit of analysis on the energy bills. It's using basically the same amount of energy for both the 62 and 70 degrees. There really isn't a discernible difference between them. Um, another way is uh, you can correct it for weather and uh, uh, comes out at right about the same uh, uh, amount of usage. So yes, this is jargon, um, uh, but uh, just showing you some of the numbers behind it. There's really just not a big difference. I would have expected a substantial difference in energy use between these two. If anything, it appears that uh, uh, keeping the house at 62 degrees might have used a, a fractionally more energy. Um, uh, probably because the, the steam systems actually like warmer temperatures uh, uh, quite often. So uh, anyway, there's really no difference in usage. And this is a, an old house that's been fixed kind of well. It's not amazing. It's pretty good. Um, but uh, you would expect uh, from what you hear about setback uh, uh, and changing the temperature that there would be a difference between the energy usage of these two. So this house is in, in okay shape and there's really no difference. So here's another thing about what that means. If you have a newer house and you're uncomfortable, this happened to some friends of mine from church actually. Uh, 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 my friend's wife uh, complains that the house is too cold. Well, they have the house set at 66, which is cold. Um, uh, measured the, the leakage on the house, it's uh, really quite low, one of the lowest results that I've, I've seen. And so I told them, just turn your thermostat up a couple degrees, see if that makes you comfortable, see if it changes your bills. It may not move them that much. Um, uh, their real problem is a hugely oversized furnace that's about triple the size of what they actually need to heat the house. Um, and so they're, they have a room above the garage, the bonus room, that just doesn't heat well. And it's not going to change until that changes. So it's, so, but when we go look at a house, we get an idea of is the solution going to be more uh, building enclosure based or is it going to be furnace and air conditioning based? Um, uh, that's part of our initial consultations. So, but the, the, the great Reagan line, freezing in the dark, uh, was what he joked about Jimmy Carter folks doing. Um, with an efficient home, you don't have to. Um, you just make the house efficient to begin with, and then you live comfortably. In fact, that is really what we aim at. We aim at your comfort. If you are comfortable, uh, uh, truly comfortable, the house is not going to use very much energy. So uh, speaking of Jimmy Carter, uh, remember this house. These clients were big Jimmy Carter fans, and they really bought into when uh, it, it, Jimmy said that uh, you 
like if you're a good American, you don't set your thermostat above 68 degrees. So they didn't. Although my partner who is working on his house, uh, he actually changed their uh, thermostat. So when it read 68, it actually meant 70. So the set point got bumped two degrees, which can be a pretty substantial two degrees for energy use. Um, but they still realized 40% energy savings uh, from that. And re remember, this was only changing out the furnace uh, and air conditioner and uh, air sealing the house. Those are the only changes. There's no insulation changes in this house. So when you come right down to it, uh, programmable thermostats are only likely to even begin to save you money if your house stinks, um, if it's very leaky. Um, uh, what you're going to do is just suffer. Uh, wouldn't it be better to actually fix the house? So, all right, that's it. Um, there's five energy efficiency myths debunked. Um, insulation is not the best way to save energy. Air sealing is. Bigger furnaces and air conditioners are not better. The right sized ones that are multiple stage are. Um, focusing on low hanging fruit does not save a lot of energy. Going deeper does. Um, and a house uh, does not have to breathe. The people do. So you want to just provide for fresh air coming from nice places, not ugly places. And programmable thermostats do not always save money. Um, so uh, uh, there's five different uh, myths debunked. So do you get the sense that there's really more to this home performance thing that you, than you might uh, have first thought? Um, yeah, we, we do too. Uh, it, it took a lot of time to, to learn it well enough to be able to teach this. Uh, so there's a lot going on underneath the surface and you really have to think your way through. So uh, thank you for watching. Spend some more time on the website. Um, and uh, if you would like to start the process, it all begins with an initial consultation where we ask you a bunch of questions about what you're trying to fix. And then we run a blower door test to find out how much your, your house leaks. Wonder of wonders. Uh, it's a really key thing we need to know. And then we uh, uh, tell you about the process from there. So spend some time on there. Thank you for watching and have yourself a lovely day.